Hi, my name is Ben Clay. I'm a final year medical student at the University of Cambridge, and welcome to Hyponatremia Made Simple, the Cambridge Approach. Hyponatremia describes a high level of blood sodium. This can be a very confusing topic to medical students and to anyone in the medical field, as it can be very confusing to tell the difference between hypernatremia and hyponatremia, and how to investigate, assess, and manage the different causes. In this video, we're going to do just that, working from the basics about how hyponatremia presents, before moving on to how we investigate it and how we manage it. Firstly, it's good to remind ourselves about what is normal and what is abnormal. A normal blood sodium level is between 135 and 145 millimoles per litre. Anything outside of this range is abnormal and describes hypo if it's low and hypernatremia if it's high. Usually, a hyponatremia or a hypernatremia would be picked up incidentally on routine blood tests, but there can be some clinical features alongside. Firstly, thinking about hyponatremia, symptoms of mild hyponatremia include general malaise, which is feeling unwell, nausea and low appetite. Symptoms of moderate hyponatremia, talking about in that sort of 125 millimoles to 130 millimoles per litre range. Those symptoms include a headache, being more irritable than usual, and some confusion. Then finally, symptoms of severe hyponatremia, which are uncommon but important to know about, include seizures and reduced consciousness, including coma. On the other side of things, mild hypernatremia can present with thirst, as it's usually a sign of hypovolemia, that is, a low amount of total fluid in the body. Again, malaise and nausea, so quite non-specific symptoms between mild hyponatremia and hypernatremia. Moderate hypernatremia also presents fairly similarly to moderate hyponatremia, with headache, generalised weakness and confusion. And then finally, a severe hyponatremia often presents with muscle spasms, twitching, seizures and coma. The assessment of hypernatremia is much simpler than the assessment of hyponatremia. There are two main mechanisms which cause hyponatremia, loss of water and excess of salt, and salt overload. The vast majority of cases fall into the first of these, loss of water and excess of salt, which describes the body losing more water without losing salt. And the main causes of this are uncompensated polyuria, sweating, and watery diarrhea. Sweating is simple to understand. Sweat contains less salt than the blood, such that when we sweat, we overall lose fluid more than salt, causing an increased concentration of salt in the blood. Watery diarrhea, again, you lose a great volume of water and not as much sodium, so you lose water more than sodium and increase the concentration of sodium in the blood. Uncompensated polyuria, we'll talk a bit more about. So, polyuria simply describes increased urination, and uncompensated, what I'm referring to there, is that these patients are always low in total body volume, they're hypovolemic, and uncompensated means that these patients have been unable to replace the amount of fluid that they have lost, mainly just because they are losing so much fluid due to diuresis. Osmotic diuresis describes the loss of water in urine due to the presence of another substance within the urine which is drawing water into it. Normally, the main controller of how much water is lost in the urine is the amount of sodium in the urine. But in this case, there's another substance in the urine which is drawing water into it, increasing the amount of water lost in urine without increasing the amount of sodium lost in the urine. Again, in this case, we lose more water than sodium in the urine, which leads to an increase in blood sodium. The main cause that we think about for an osmotic diuresis is glucose in the urine. And this is usually due to diabetes mellitus, where we have hyperglycemia, a high level of blood glucose, and this level can be so high such that it leaks over into the urine and glucose is osmotically active such that when it's present in the urine it draws wa more water into the urine and increases the amount of water lost in the urine. The other cause of an uncompensated polyuria is much less common and it's diabetes insipidus. This is not related to diabetes mellitus which describes defects in glucose handling. Diabetes insipidus refers to a lack of response to ADH, which is antidiuretic hormone. ADH is produced by the posterior pituitary gland in the brain, 
and tells the kidney to hang on to water. And this acts late on in the kidney and says, just reabsorb water, please. And there are several causes for diabetes insipidus. They can be classified into a lack of production of ADH, which is due to problems in the brain, and a lack of response to ADH in the kidney, which has several other causes. But in all of these cases, the kidney loses its ability to respond to that signal from the brain saying, hang on to water. Therefore, it just sheds lots of water into the urine, so we lose water in excess of salt. The other causes of hypernatremia are due to salt overload. These are much less common. Let's think about them in terms of euvolemia and hypervolemia. The euvolemic causes are simply the causes that we spoke about earlier, but in this case, we've got compensated polyuria. In these cases, they're the same causes as earlier, but the patient has been able to effectively replace the amount of water they have lost, so they're actually euvolemic. The other causes which are distinct are where we have hypervolemic hypernatremia. And in these cases, it's due to real salt overload, either having too much salt taken into the body or just not being able to get rid of salt. In the first case, this is talking about salt poisoning which is where the patient has either for some reason eaten an enormous amount of salt, this can be due to drinking salt water, just eating a load of salt, or in some cases it can be iatrogenic, where the doctors have given too much saline therapy and overloaded the patient with salt. This salt then hangs on to water, so you get hypervolemia, but you still have given so much salt that the concentration in the blood is still too high. The other cause is hyperaldosteronism. Aldosterone works on the kidney and acts to get rid of potassium into the urine and hang on to sodium. And in this case, we have too much aldosterone, you get that signal happening too much. So we get rid of lots of potassium, so you can also end up with hypokalemia, but it tells the body to hang on to lots of sodium, so you get hypernatremia. And a key cause of hyperaldosteronism is Kohn's syndrome, which is primary hyperaldosteronism. Next. Again, much more simply than hyponatremia, the management of hyponatremia is simple and the same for all causes mainly. Obviously, if there's an underlying cause, we'd want to treat that first and foremost. But in terms of addressing the electrolyte abnormality itself, the hyponatremia, in these cases, we've got too much salt concentrated into the blood, so you want to dilute that. So first line, if the patient can, we want to just encourage them to drink water orally. And secondly, if they can't do that, or it's too severe, or this has failed, we want to provide dilution into the blood intravenously. But unlike with hyponatremia, we do not want to be giving any additional salt into the blood because they've already got a high concentration of sodium in the blood. In this case, we want to provide fluid, which is isotonic. That is, it's not going to cause massive shifts in fluid across the body compartments, but while not providing more sodium into the blood. And the way that we do that is providing glucose or dextrose fluid. Again, another word of warning, similarly to hyponatremia, we never want to correct hypernatremia too quickly for a similar reason to hyponatremia. If there's a sudden drop in blood sodium level, such that the blood becomes much more dilute, then that fluid can shift into the brain rather than from the brain like we saw in hyponatremia. So you can get a big fluid shift into the brain via osmosis and cause cerebral edema, which can be very dangerous. Thank you for watching this video. Before you go, I want to highlight two more resources which are really useful for all medical students. The first of these is my physical examinations for OSCE ebook. This is the combination of all of my experience of six years of medical school in Cambridge, and it provides clear and concise examination checklists for all of the most common examinations you'll encounter in OSCEs and also in clinical practice. You can access this book by scanning the QR code or going to claimmedicalconsulting.com. It's available for a half price compared to the paper copy at £9.99 and you can pay in any currency at checkout. The second of these resources is the AI powered question banks by medibuddy.co.uk. These AI question banks are specifically designed for the UK MLA and PLAB exams. The PLAB exam is the international exam that all international medical graduates hoping to practice in the UK will take. And the UK MLA is the standardised UK medical final that all UK medical students will take from 2025 onwards. The PLAB will become the UK MLA from 2024 onwards, and MediBuddy are the only online provider 
who have specifically written 4,000 questions which target the MLA contact map specifically so that you cover everything you need to and don't waste time covering anything unnecessary. I've negotiated a 10% discount for everyone who uses the code BC10 on those UK MLA and PLAB question banks. Thank you. Thank you again for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please like, comment and subscribe to see more from me. Thank you.